translate. So make sure you memorize the slide because you're going to need it in the words. Okay, uh, all the other things that you say, like I said, like cholesterol, um, when, you, when you actually do the, the, like the equivalent of SAG in the acidic fluid, we do like the pillar fluid albumin gradient, um, just to rule out like, like an acidic effusion. And you can also send the analysis for bilirubin. Um, if you have like red blood cells, you think about either this is trauma, malignancy, pulmonary embolism, or an infection. Um, and hemothorax, actually the, pearl, the pleural fluid, hematocrit, is actually close to the, the body's hematocrit. So that's another, another test that we, we usually send when we're confronted with a question about suspecting a pneumothorax. Okay, so other things that you think about, like if the eosinophils are, are, are pretty, pretty, like greater than 10%, you think about, you know, either malignancy, uh, uh, drugs that can actually concuss this, parasites, church straws, remember the vasculitis that we talk about, that we don't call it church straws anymore. Um, if you have lymphocytes, predominant lymphocytic uh, effusion, you think about malignancy, TB, or sarcoidosis, or after patients get a coronary bypass syndrome. Do you guys remember Dressler syndrome? Do you guys remember that on your boards? Okay, so it's like a, like a, like after a thoracotomy or a sternotomy, you can develop like a form of pericarditis. Same thing happened in the lungs. You can actually get a, a lymphocytic um, effusion after cabbage. And uh, if you see mesothelial cells, it's uh, it's actually you you think about either like mesothelioma, you think about a tubercular effusion. And uh, glucose, when you have very decreased glucose, you think about either pneumonic effusions, malignant effusions, rheumatoid disease. That's the reason why we send the rheumatoid factor. And these are actually very rare causes of like low glucose and lupus and short strauss as well. Okay, so pancreatitis, you actually do like that's the reason why we send the amylase because there may be a thirst patient from pancreatitis or when the patients actually have an exophageal rupture because it's a, it's a GI tract enzyme um, how do you call that syndrome when you get an exophageal rupture? Or have, or have yeah and then uh, what's the risk factor for the developing that? Mm -hmm. It's extremely painful. So that's one of the differentials of severe chest pain. You think about dissection, pulmonary embolism, or like an esophageal rupture. Uh, that's why you ask the patient about any GI symptoms every time they present with chest pains. So malignant infusions, you, you order the amylase level, it's, it's elevated about 10% of the patients. Okay, like the pleural effusion by the pH analysis, you know, you, you always think about, like I said, like, like rheumatoid, TB, uh, systemic acidosis, lupus, uh, urinothorax, I'm yet to find such a case but I know it's been described um, or the parapneumonic effusions actually the pH can be can be low. Uh, the ADA level I told you guys that we do it when we think about like like um, like when when you know that there's no empyema because an empyema can actually give you a positive ADA but there's no empyema and it's virtually diagnostic of a tuberculosis effusion when you have an ADA level greater than 50. Uh, interferon, uh, interferon gamma is also a, a test, an additional test we don't order routinely when we suspect tubercular effusion. Uh, rheumatoid factor, when you suspect this is rheumatoid arthritis related, ANA, you can send it on the fluid analysis. And the triglycerides, just to rule out chylothorax related to trauma or some sort of idiopathic rupture of one of the of the chyle um, lymph, lymph, um, lymph uh, vessel. Um, and if you have pus or a positive culture, obviously you think about an empyema. Okay, so pneumonic infusions. Um, these are the, the American College of um, um, it's not called the American Thoracic, American College of, you guys know what ACCP is? I'm trying to think. American Chest. I forget what I wrote this slide. Yeah, but anyway, the bottom line is that, you know, like, we call it a complicated, complicated when, actually when the pH is less than 70, when the glucose is less than 40, 
and these patients they have to they have to have a thor thoracostomy so you cannot get rid of an empyema just with antibiotics if, if it's very complicated and that's a clinical judgment I've seen doctors actually taking the patients for thoracostomy or for even for like a VATS uh, in the setting of an empyema when they have a class 3 effusion but class 4 is definitely a must indication for antibiotic and surgical drainage I'm sorry? It is the American chest physicians? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I'm, I'm used to um, one of my attendants, um, Dr. Kaminger. You probably met him, at all of you. Um, Natter, Natter Kaminger. Sounds familiar. He, he's the guy who, um, who was actually the state, the state of California expert uh, in the Michael Jackson's case because he's, he's quadruple certified in internal medicine, uh, pulmonology, sleep medicine, and critical care medicine. Um, the, guy actually, the guy actually was the state expert. How, that's how they were able to convict this guy. The, the, he did so many things wrong. Actually, if you have time, uh, look in YouTube for his name and you're gonna see the videos. He was so elegant the way, the way he broke down all the malpractice that this guy did. Like he broke it down like, like in points for everybody. It's, it was pretty, pretty elegant the way he did it. Um, um, I forget why I just started describing this guy. Oh yeah, so this guy belongs to, he's the editor, he's the chief editor for the chest, for the, you know, for the, for the publication for the American College of Chest Physicians. He's a pretty big shot. If you ever ever meet him there, just tell him that I say hi. He's, he's a very good guy. Very, very smart guy. Okay, so sleep disorders briefly, because I know you guys are tired. So we have um, OSA, you know, risk factors. We all know them. Obesity, facial soft tissue abnormalities, sm smoking, nasal congestion, and uh, diabetes. So you guys know that you diagnose it with a sleep study. And uh, there is an apnea, hypopnea index that they are able to measure when they do a sleep study. So based on the apnea hypopnea index, we, call, we classify sleep apnea in three stages, mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, so mild is five to 15. Uh, and these patients actually, they have saturations anywhere from 90 to 95. Moderate 15 to 30. And um, these patients actually, they're definitely sleepy or narcolepsy during the day. And greater than 30, these patients shouldn't be driving. And I actually have a patient who he's a truck driver, and he didn't pass he didn't pass the sleep apnea test, and he was asking me to write him a letter that he was okay to go drive, and the guy actually got really upset at me. But this is you're gonna get awkward requests for the patient. I'm using his ex this example to tell you guys that you have to be very firm, and you know like sometimes you know when you're when you're inexperienced or when you're just starting in this business, and they tell you you know you need to make your patients happy. You need to be firm in telling your patients, like, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is this is the right thing to do. And they're gonna get upset at you. It doesn't matter, you're very professional. Like like I told you the other day, if you prescribe narcotics, you need to understand what the law says. Because if, if, if you're trying to be nice and you exceed the recommendation, you cannot defend that in court. Had I written the, the okay to drive note for this guy, probably I would have probably lost my license already. So I want I want you guys to, the guy had like a, I remember like a like a 34 events in one night. I told the guy like, this is not even safe for you or the society. He got very pissed off. He, he actually he never came back, but you know, like I'm telling you guys, I'm using that example to teach you that like you need to, as a physician, you need to say no. You, you've worked hard enough to get here. Don't let a stupid decision get you in trouble. And you're gonna get very awkward requests from patients. And then these patients they usually have like, like desaturations usually like less than 90%, like 20% of the time. So why is it important that we treat? Because the mortality is actually pretty high. This is associated with secondary hypertension. We talked about it. Pulmonary hypertension, myocardial infarction, strokes, arrhythmias, usually atrial arrhythmias. And the treatment is associated with improved quality of life and decreased mortality. So please, when you identify the patients, refer them for treatment. I haven't, you know, it's, it's interesting because no one, just imagine the idea of sleeping with a pretty loud piece of equipment next to you in a mask. It's almost like unthinkable that you're gonna be able to fall asleep with that thing. But in my practice, I've seen patients that actually they love it and they cannot live without it because they were so miserable for so many years that when they started using it, when a phys physician was able to diagnose them and they actually saw the benefits and they recovered the stamina and they're not falling asleep everywhere, they love you. 
but the most common scenario is that the patients are, are going to tell you, I don't like it, I can't sleep with it, I feel claustrophobic. So your job as a doctor is to keep counseling them. Like, you know, sleep apnea is a lethal disease and you tell them the evidence. You can actually print articles for them. This is why it is important that we treat it. It can save your life. Like, one of my dialysis patients recently, she, she had a massive hem hemispheric stroke and she was very thin lady. She was an Asian, 50-something year old, very thin lady. Nobody would have thought that she had a sleep apnea and part of the stroke evaluation is to do a sleep, st a sleep study. She had severe sleep apnea and actually I felt pretty bad because I should, have, I should have identified that and I should have referred the patient because that was her risk factor for developing a stroke and I felt pretty bad because when I did more, more research into it, I realized that people have looked into this and up to 40% of dialysis patients, they actually have a sleep apnea, whether or not they're obese. So that's why I'm sharing this case with you guys. But the treatment is usually, you, we all know weight reduction, alcohol and drug avoidance. A lot of the patients, they take a lot of like sleeping medications over the counter and non over the counter. And, um, and, and really the treatment is the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, you know, if the patient has like any, any more than five events, that's, that's enough to, to treat these patients. But, you know, if they, have, if they have symptoms. But if they have like more than 15 without any symptoms, everybody should get in treated. There are some oral appliances. If you Google like oral appliances for sleep apnea, they're gonna wanna sell you like a lot of stuff. I don't even know if there's any evidence-based studies on, this, on these devices, but you may wanna encourage your patients to discuss that with the sleep apnea specialist. And the surgery is actually the last resort, but it's not always curative for these patients. Uh, lastly, the obesity hypoventilation syndrome, the Pigwickians. Uh, these patients, they, they have the chronic hypercapnia and the, the post hypercapnia metabolic alkalosis. BMI is usually greater than 35. I have a patient um, that her BMI is 72. It's crazy, but you know, you're gonna see, you're gonna see things like that in clinical practice. So, and there's no other cause of hypoventilation. You see that in um, uh, severe OSA or in core pulmonary and the outcomes of this patient is pretty bad. This, this disease actually carries pretty high mortality. All right, it was a lot, I'm sorry. Pulmonary is, 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 is pretty extensive. I, I didn't even talk about lung masses. I started like, like, like doing this lung masses like I'm gonna kill them if I do the lung masses, this is too much. But uh, because there are very specific recommendations uh, regarding pulmonary nodules and, and how we do it. But um, what time is it? You guys have a, my, 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 my phone froze. You know how I'm going to, okay. Any questions? Do you give these lectures somewhere? Yeah, I'm going to, you guys are going to get them. No, I mean, like, do you actually go to any schools or No. No, no I do it for Dr. Benzer. Right? Yeah, because number one, it's, it's, it's actually like a type of like, like appreciation that I have with, with Dr. Benzer for what he did for me. And number two, you know, I have three kids, so <laughs> my life is very complicated right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't get a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But I still have a genuine interest in, in education. I do, I do have like the fellows. I teach once a month at the VA, it's the pool at the VA, at the nephrology clinic. I'm one of the volunteer attendants. Um, and I actually, the fellows, the nephrology fellows, they go to my home dialysis clinic in San Fernando. They, they just shadow me in my clinic. And uh, the other educational thing that I'm doing right now is that I'm, um, um, I'm, I'm applying for, for being faculty at the new Kaiser Medical School. But that's gonna actually, I'm gonna have to take away a lot of my clinical responsibilities to be able to teach because I won't be able to do like both things at the same time. But we don't even know how that's gonna happen because the, the school was, was approved by the board of directors they already have a dean. They already they already they already elected the board of directors, and uh, now they're they're actually they're approving the architectural design. They have like four different designs. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be like like it's going to be like no other medical school in the U.S. because the the space is limited. So they're going to do a lot of like technology um, oriented resources, and it's right there in the heart of Pasadena and Los Robles Avenue. It's going to be awesome. So hopefully. Hopefully I'll get to do some teaching over there. It's opening in 2019, so three more years. It's exciting. Yeah. All right, any other question, guys? 
if uh, if you guys still here this week, I told Dr. Vincent I can come.